My Lord, I appear on behalf of the local authority leading Miss Waters. The other representation is as follows. My learned friend, Miss Fotrell, King's Council, leading Mr. Poval on behalf of the mother. Learned friend, Mr. Spencer, King's Council, leading Mr. Wakedi on behalf of the father. Learned friend, Mr. Sampson, King's Council, leading Miss Brennan on behalf of FT. And my learned friend, Miss Connolly, King's Council, leading Mr. Jackson on behalf of the children. Yes, now before you proceed, can I say one thing? And it may be that there are other preliminary matters that council need to raise with the court as well. Uh, what I wanted to say is that, as I understand it, this hearing, as is now the norm in the Court of Appeal, is being live streamed. A and that has two consequences. One is that we must all be conscious of the need not inadvertently to name the children, for example, or mention other details of the case which might lead to their identification. It's very easily done, and it can happen from the bench, if I may say so. But we must be very careful for that reason. The second thing that may not be so well known is that the consequence is that, as I understand it, there can be a recording which can be viewed later on the internet. And so it, it becomes, as it were, a permanent record of the proceedings. Uh, so it's not just a live, literally live streamed hearing. Your Lordship will have noted the abbreviations and the way I introduce the parties. Indeed. I intend to stick with that plan as such, and I invite my learned friends to do the same if that's acceptable to the court. Yes, thank you. Thank you, my Lord. Uh, are there other preliminary matters? Uh, I know that Ms. Fotrell wanted to say something very briefly about interpretation, yes. and of course there's a preliminary application listed before the substantive appeal on the father's application which shouldn't take any time at all, but those are the preliminary issues. Very well. Yes, Ms. Watchful. My Lord, I, I must apologise, but we are without an interpreter for my client, um, and she doesn't have sufficient English to be able to follow the proceedings without the assistance of an interpreter. Um, I understand the interpreter is on his way and close to court, but I can't give any more detail than that. Um, Mr. Spencer has very kindly offered that his interpreter might assist my client also, which I think might require some organisation of the sitting arrangements in court. Uh, I'm content with that if the court is content, but I, I do need to raise it because she can't follow the proceedings mm. without assistance. Mm. Will that require us to rise for a moment? Um, I, I'll have to turn my back and see where everybody is sitting, if you'll excuse me. Um, yes, I, I think some, well, it, it might just be that the interpreter sits between the parents. And I, I don't want to micromanage any of that, but I'm, I'm sure that can be arranged at the back of the court. All right. well, well, it is a difficulty for us yeah, because well, we haven't I do had understand. a chance to speak with her yet, yeah. I'm afraid. Are you, are you going to need an adjournment for that purpose? Ideally, I would like to have 10 minutes with her before the court starts hearing uh, the appeal, but I also recognise we are under time pressure and it's 20 to 11. So we are. Um, if, if the court wants to start, I'm not going to press that, but, but I am just raising it in terms of an issue as to her participation. Mm. Ms. Bottrell, we're very sympathetic to your position, but uh, given the pressure of time, we feel that we should proceed. Yes. Um, but if at some point during the hearing you do need some time to discuss things with your client, that then we will certainly hear you again. Yes, I I'm, I'm fully instructed in terms of presenting her case. All right. It's really just in terms of speaking okay. to her. And I'm told the interpreter is now in the building, so he will appear right. any moment, I hope. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and was there an application for the father? My lord, my, my lord, my lady, yes. Uh, there is um, an unagreed bundle uh, and an application for the commission to rely on its yes. content is advanced. The bundle is far from voluminous. It's yeah, I've seen it. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, is that resisted by anyone? My lord, I look across. Well, yes. It is. Well, there are two ways we can deal with this. We, we, we could look at anything that council wishes to look at without deciding its admissibility until the judgment is given, if it becomes necessary to do so. Uh, or if, if there's an objection that we need to resolve before the appeal is heard, then we'll hear you. 
The Lord, I would certainly support a proportionate route, All right. namely the former rather than the latter. All right. Well, that, that's how we'll proceed then. Grateful. Thank you very much. Then do you want to open your appeal? My Lord, we invite the court to grant this appeal and to restore the findings of the deputy district judge. The local authority's approach to this appeal is to divide it into three separate strands, broad strands of argument. The first of which is to address this court as to whether Judge Greensmith was wrong to set the district judge's findings aside. Second, whether the circuit judge was wrong not to remit. And third, whether the circuit judge was wrong in relation to the interim care orders continuing. My Lord, I intend to take those points in reverse order, not least because I have little to say about the last of those. If I may begin with the discrete question of Judge Greensmith's analysis of the position post-judgment as to the continuation of the interim care orders. Judge Greensmith allowed the appeal on all grounds. The court obviously did not direct a rehearing. There was no remission. And the court did not dismiss the proceedings. Instead, Judge Greensmith listed a further hearing on the 2nd of March 2023. And accordingly, the consequence of the orders that Judge Greensmith made were, first of all, that the interim care orders in respect of the younger children remained in place. And second, <coughs> the full care order made in respect of FT remained in force. In our submission, the analysis behind both of those decisions was completely wrong and unjustifiable. And the judge gave himself, thereby, a jurisdiction that he did not have. <clears throat> to be clear, my lord, in a case where a judge's decision in those terms will come under a second appeal, as it now does, the judge will have jurisdiction, will have a power under Section 40 of the Children Act to continue interim care orders in respect of the subject children as a holding position pending appeal. But this court will have seen, and uh, I don't invite the court to go to the specific reference for the sake of time unless you need to, but at core bundle page 64, which is part of the exchanges between Judge Greensmith and counsel post-judgment, he explicitly indicates that he is not making a Section 40 decision. And that being the only jurisdiction available to him in our submission, he erred in deciding <clears throat> that the interim care orders previously made could continue. In short, the judge's justification for proceeding on that way was that under Section 38 of the Children Act, the <clears throat> interim care orders were originally made on the basis that the local authority could demonstrate that there were reasonable grounds for believing that the substantive threshold criteria were met, and notwithstanding his dismissal of every single factual, con uh, factual allegation levied by the local authority at the first instance hearing, the learned judge found that the interim care order originally made on the basis of reasonable grounds, survived his decision and should therefore continue. That cannot have been right, because in dismissing after a full hearing and on this appeal, the factual foundations for the entirety of the local authority's case, plainly the reasonable grounds test at the interim care level, <coughs> at the interim care order level, could not survive that decision. I note that the mother in her permission skeleton, only in her permission skeleton, argues that the local authority did not at that stage apply to withdraw. That would never have been the proper procedural route to take. 
the local authority had no reason to withdraw. Its care application had, in effect, been refused in terms of the facts by the judge. And the only proper course available to the circuit judge, therefore, was to dismiss the care proceedings. So under section 38, where in any proceed one, where in any proceedings on an application for care order, the proceedings are adjourned, the court may make, I'm missing words out, the court may make an interim care order. So in this case, he was purporting to adjourn the proceedings, so if he adjourned the proceedings, he had the power to make an interim care order, but you say under subsection 2, he shall not make an interim care order unless it is satisfied that there are reasonable grounds for believing the circumstances with respect to the child are as made out under section 31. Two. My lord, exactly. Where the court has decided not to make findings after a full fact finding hearing, your point is that the court can't um, have reasonable grounds for believing the threshold is crossed. And there need be no surer foundation of that submission than the judge's own words that he had rejected all the facts that the local authority contended supported the making of public law orders. Was there any reason to adjourn? There was no reason to adjourn. There was no jurisdiction to adjourn at that mm -hmm. stage. The only proper course would have been dismissal. Yeah, sure. Now, it is suggested to this court at one point, and I cite the mother skeleton, mm. that the circuit judge was aware that there were allegations by a younger child, S, of physical abuse. And so it's argued that it might have been precipitous to set aside the interim care orders. However, the circuit judge did not hear any argument about that. There was no evidential basis on which he could have used those physical abuse allegations as justification for continuing the interim care orders. The police had taken no further action in respect of those allegations. And so there was no evidential foundation to proceed on that basis. A bit topsy-turvy this argument, isn't it? You're, put, you're putting forward this as your... Um, it's the sort of point one might expect to be the other way around, but anyway. Well, it's the I understand why your lordship says that, but it's the point that is going to, I think, attract the fewest submissions, and certainly from my part, the briefest. And it's for that reason I thought I'd get it out of the way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I uh, assist the court on that point in any other respect? Thank you. Your lordships will also have observed, have observed that there is, after Judge Green Smith's judgment a postscript in which he is critical of the local authority in various respects arising from observations about community knowledge and is, is this relevant to the appeal do we need to go into it well only in so far my lord as the postscript is couched in terms of findings the judge says i find that mm -hmm. in so far as he uses that language it is apt in my submission to be overturned by this court for all the other reasons we articulate, because his analysis on that front um, falls foul of the same problems that we articulate on the substantive appeal. In short, if this court allows our appeal now, the observations made during the postscript must also fall away and be set aside. My Lord, I will say no more about that. Now, bearing in mind my Lord, Lord Justice Baker's observations about topsy-turvy-ness, uh, I had hoped to then address Your Lordships and my Lady on the issue of remission, mm. and to deal with that also relatively briefly, and then to come finally to the question of the integrity of the Deputy District Judge's findings and the approach that was taken by Judge Greensmith on appeal. Mm. May I deal with the question of the remission decision? Yes. The basis on which Judge Greensmith decided not to remit the case was that no court could have made findings of fact on the facts available to it. In my submission, if Judge Greensmith was right to 
set aside the deputy district judge's findings, and of course we argue that he was not, plainly he should have remitted the case. As we say on paper, the error of a first instance tribunal, if there was an error, does not vitiate the validity of the exercise on appeal or at first instance itself. It merely points to the need to do it properly. What, therefore, I ask rhetorically, is the law in relation to the remission decision? I rely on the observations of Lord Justice Peter Jackson in RIA number two, <coughs> 2019, EWCA Civ 1947, which is in the authorities bundle at page 151. Within that judgment, <coughs> And in deciding that on the facts of that case, that the case before the Court of Appeal should be remitted for an unusual third fact-finding hearing, Lord Justice Peter Jackson articulated a number of relevant matters that must be taken into account. And I cite from the judgment at, page, at paragraph 127. This is in our... Um... This is in the authorities bundle. Yes. Or I should say the first authorities bundle. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 127. In deciding this issue, the court has a broad discretion, and the discretion is particularly broad when we're considering whether to order what is probably an unprecedented second hearing. Okay. All relevant matters must be taken into account. So a broad discretion... And then the court articulates the particular factors of relevance in that case, which in our submission are likely to be applicable factors in the majority, if not all, of remission. But it is open to the appeal court in these circumstances, isn't it, to conclude that no reasonable judge could have made the findings? Absolutely. I had a vague recollection, Mr Goodwin, that I had said that in a judgment. And I see Ms. Fortrell's found it it's some years ago in Re W Re F in the New Bundle of Authorities. And I think there may be other cases in which this court has made that and reached that conclusion. So it is possible. For it is possible. Court. So, uh, but you said they've got, the judge has got to go through something like the discipline that Lord Justice Peter Jackson the judge, articulates. The judge has to go through uh, an evaluative discipline, which was completely absent here. But insofar as this court today uh, wants to say anything in judgment about the factors that should be taken into account, I refer, first of all, to these uh, observations made by Lord Justice Peter Jackson. I'm not going to describe them as criteria because he says that they are factors that he takes into account in that particular case. And they are the seriousness of the issues, the interests of the children, the likely evidential result the fairness of a further trial and the impact on the family. Plainly, that is not an exclusive list. But I do venture to suggest, my Lord, that there's a, there's a gateway through which the appeal court has to pass before it can begin to address those factors. And that gateway is simply whether it considers that any court could properly make findings of fact on the available evidence. If that gateway is not passed, because no court could make any findings on the evidence available, then in my submission it would be artificial for the court to go on to consider the interests of the children, the seriousness of the issues, the fairness of a further trial, the impact upon the family, and those other factors articulated by Lord Justice Peter Jackson. Because, simply, if the evidence didn't support the findings sought by the local authority, there'd be no purpose at all in proceeding to a remitted further fact-finding hearing. If the gateway is crossed and the appeal court considers that findings could, 
excuse me, potentially be made on the evidence, then in my submission, those other factors come into play and the court has to conduct an evaluation and a balancing of the different factors in deciding whether to remit. Applying those observations briefly to the facts of this case, first, Judge Greensmith did not conduct the necessary balancing exercise. Second, Judge Greensmith did not watch the ABE interview or hear any of the live evidence. And then one can see, curiously, in Judge Greensmith's exchanges with counsel, and I refer to the core bundle at page 63, This should be the transcript of the exchanges between the judge and counsel. Your Lordship will see about a quarter way down that page, the judge says absolutely not in response to a submission by the local authority. He said, I have no intention today of dismissing these proceedings. All I've done and intended to do is to say the judge was wrong to make those specific findings. And in my submission, it would flow from that if Judge Greensmith were correct in having found Judge Hornby's findings to be wrong. If that is the sum of what the judge on appeal decided, it would presumably flow from that that there should be a remission to a further hearing. My Lord, that is all I wish to say on the question of remission, subject to any questions of me from court. And I turn, therefore, to the third and more substantive part of my argument, which relates to Judge Greensmith's approach to the Deputy District Judge's findings. Yes. Our first ground of appeal is that Judge Greensmith failed properly to direct himself as to the role of the appellate court or to apply the directions he did give himself properly. He did refer to several authorities, Henderson and Foxworth and Re S. We have those in the core bundle at page 58. You mean his references? Sorry, page... His references. You said we have them. We're in the core bundle. What yes. he said about them. Exactly. You have Sorry. those references. Thank you. 56, you give me, not 58. 56. The law relevant to this appeal, FPR part 30, and then re -S, and then Henderson and Foxworth. He refers to the observations of Lord Reed in Henderson and Foxworth that what matters, bottom of the page, what matters is whether the decision under appeal is one that no reasonable judge could have reached. And above that, re -S, Lord Justice Peter Jackson, an appeal court may only interfere with findings of fact in limited circumstances, including where there's been a serious flaw in the evaluation of the evidence or where it has been shown that the conclusion cannot reasonably reasonably be justified. <coughs> but the judge did not direct himself as to the advantage that the first instance judge had in hearing evidence from witnesses and in our submission the omission of a self-direction in those terms is particularly important in this case 
because there is such a stark omission in the substance of Judge Greensmith's judgment in failing to recognize those very first instance advantages. You know, Mr. Goodwin, can I just ask, was he referred to, for example, the decision in Fage or the other cases um, by Joan Case, the dicta about? They're in the skeletons. So, so he was referred to the well known dicta, which is frequently cited in this court from, Lord Just for example, Lord Justice Lewis in the Fage case. Mm. So he, he was. Right, thank you. There's two points potentially implicit in what you've just submitted. One is the point about the advantages which the trial judge has of hearing live evidence. There's a different point, arguably, which is the phage point, I think, which is the dangers of island hopping, mm -hmm. which is that the trial judge has the entire sea of evidence. I, my lord, they are certainly different points. And we seek to make good our submission in reliance on both of them, uh, as your lordship knows. I wanted to make some general observations about the original judgment and then the approach that Judge Greensmith took before I <clears throat> move on to consider in more detail the other grounds on which we advance this appeal. But our bullet point submissions in relation to Judge Hornby's judgment, and this is very much standing back from the detail within it, we submit that it was what I will describe as a granular judgment that engaged with the detail. The deputy district judge was clearly on top of the detail, to put it more colloquially. He surveyed a wide canvas of evidence and drew on that wide canvas when making his factual decisions. He looked at the evidence critically and he engaged with the counter arguments. He conducted an evaluative exercise that balanced the different facts. There were no errors of law within the first instance judgment. Looking again only in broad terms at the way Judge Greensmith approached the appeal before him, first of all, he adopted the role of a primary assessor of fact, which was an error of law. He undertook his own research on Google, thereby introducing new evidence into the appeal. That decision in and of itself crossed the line between a mere review of the deputy district judge and a de novo appellate assessment of the facts. Next, Judge Greensmith observed that it was implausible in the extreme that the abuse took place in the manner described without any report to the police. This court may consider in conjunction with the point about the Google searches conducted by Judge Greensmith, that there was extensive weight attached on the first appeal to those two points. Implausible in the extreme that the abuse could have occurred without any report to the police. I say in passing only at this stage, the evidence before the deputy district judge was that the police had conducted, had spoken to a single neighbour as part of their house to house inquiries. Next, Judge Greensmith concluded <coughs> that FT did not know the difference between truth and lies without acknowledging the deputy district judge's reasoned conclusion for accepting 
that she did and for accepting the truth of her account. The judge failed to acknowledge the weight attached by the deputy district judge to other evidence which he used to set in context the ABE interview and ultimately used to conclude that the allegations were true, namely FT's comments to the school, to the police, and to the social worker. The finding that... And to her father too. Indeed. <coughs> the evidence was that FT had told her father about the complaint some two and a half to three years before. It was contested evidence. Yes, absolutely. And you have plans about that. And I will come on to that in due course, if I may, my lord. And ultimately, Judge Greensmith made no attempt, unfortunately, to evaluate the points that he considered determinative, in particular the improbability arising from the Google search and the narrowness of the street, to evaluate those alongside the other evidence that was before the court. Mr. Goobin, can I just ask you this, did the judge deal at all with the other statements which FT had made? Did, did, did you say he didn't, he didn't note, acknowledge the, district, the deputy district judge's um, uh, reference to the other evidence which he used to set the context? Did he, did he, do, did he mention it at all in the judgment? He does not, as far as I can see. He deals at page 55 of the core bundle in a discrete section with, quote, the evidence of FT. Sorry, did you say 45? Page 55. My mistake, sorry. A third the way down, the evidence of FT. And there's no reference to her other comments <coughs> there. And then... One moves forward to 57, which is the court's analysis and assessment of the reliability of the deputy judge's findings. The judge then embarks on an analysis of the extreme implausibility of the factual scenario as he saw it, returns briefly to the ABE. But there is no reference within the balance of his judgment to those other factors. <coughs> the next point in this broad list of difficulties we suggest with Judge Greensmith's judgment is that the judge speculated as to why FT did not give evidence and why the two men were not interveners. I understand that those points were introduced by the circuit judge into the debate. No one had argued at first instance that those were deficiencies in the local authorities evidence gathering process. The local authorities evidence was drawn from the material that it had principally from the police, but also, of course, that it obtained from the school. But it is not a function of a social worker to undertake detective work and try to uh, identify third parties in the community about whose details it had been given next to nothing, the parental position being that all contact with the two men had been severed some three years before. Forgive me, Mr. Gubin, may I just take you back to your first point about the judge's observations as to why FT didn't, as to the fact that FT did, did not give evidence? Yes. Sorry. Is that the comment he makes at page 55 by the first whole panel? Is that what you're referring to? 
It is. No one sought to call FT, despite her age. The rationale for this decision is not clear. There was no contest about that. There was no re-W application. Well, it says that this decision was followed a re-W hearing, so I assume there had been some sort of hearing. Mr. Spencer's nodding. Well, as I understand it, no one advanced the suggestion at the re-W hearing that she should give evidence. Mr. There was not an effective re-W hearing because it was okay. conceded. So, the re so I remind myself, re-W hearing is a hearing where under the re-W decision, the court at a preliminary stage decides whether or not a, a person under the age of 18 should give evidence. My Lord, and in this fact. case, there was no, nobody, nobody argued in the event that she should. Indeed. Yeah, there was um, the ABE evidence, is that right? What was, and that, that, that had been um, seen, I think you said, by the deputy district judge. So how, exactly. How, so I'm more familiar with how ABE evidence is deployed in a criminal court, uh, where it stands as the evidence in chief of the witness. Um, how, how does it work in this context? It stands in the first instance as the evidence in chief on which the local authority relies that's subject to, in this case, submissions about the weight that can be attached to different parts of it, if any weight can be attached at all, and subject to submissions about inconsistencies or the internal integrity. So unlike in a criminal court where the principal challenge is through cross-examination, um, the evidence in chief being adduced in video form, in a case in the family court where uh, a re-W decision is not made for the child to give live evidence. Mm. The, the attack as such on the integrity of the ABE account has to come through submissions. Mm. But if somebody did feel it was necessary for the child to give evidence live and, and, and presumably be subject to cross-examination, absolutely, that, that's the function of the re-W. It is just, it. just that. So your, your submission is that, that that had been given consideration here and it was, nobody was suggesting that that was necessary or appropriate. And so you say the circuit judge erred in saying what he said at page 55. Yes, my, my lord, that is exactly the position. Nobody argued on appeal that there were deficiencies in the process by which the child came not to give evidence. So this appears to be an issue that Judge Greensmith introduced himself into his appeal decision. And then our, our final point in this broad summary of the first appeal judgment was that Judge Greensmith did not identify how the deputy district judge's findings failed to accord with the evidence. He failed to give any reasons of his own for reaching that conclusion. <clears throat> Judge Hornby had painstakingly recited the evidence that he had heard and then explained his interpretation of it, whereas Judge Greensmith's treatment of the evidence was, we regret to say, as we say on paper, partial and superficial. It was inadequately reasoned and it failed to take into account the broad canvas of evidence. So for all of those reasons, we submit that our ground one is made out in that there was a failure by the judge to act purely as an appellate tribunal and to afford sufficient weight and respect to the evaluative, evaluative exercise undertaken by the deputy district judge. And in doing so, Judge Greensmith adopted a role that was not open to him. And insofar as he did direct himself about the discipline to be employed on that first appeal, he did not apply those directions to his own decision. My Lord, our second ground 
relates to the ABE interview and our submission that Judge Greensmith was wrong in his approach <coughs> to the court's assessment of that interview. Two key points from Judge Greensmith's judgment. He found that the deputy judge attached significant weight to the ABE when he should have attached no weight at all. <coughs> he found that Judge Hornby failed to have regard to the requirement for the ABE guidelines to be followed and to understand the consequences if they were not. And third, he found that the ABE was, quote, peppered with leading questions and suggestive language. But he did not say what those were, nor how they affected the overall balance of the decision to be made about the quality of the interview. I would like to direct this court's attention to different aspects of the deputy judge's <coughs> approach to the ABE. First, he said in terms that it was quite clear that the guidance had not been followed. That's paragraph 156 of the judgment. Second, he said that he shared the concern about the quality of the interviewing <coughs> and lack of compliance with the guidance. Paragraph 158. So plainly, the deputy judge was aware of the departures from the guidance. The deputy judge cited from the case law, first of all, the observations of Lord Justice Underhill in re JB. This is in the judgment of <coughs> paragraph 159. I won't give the full citation. But the Court of Appeal commented in that case that even a substantial failure to observe the requirements of an ABE will not necessarily mean that a judge cannot properly rely on hearsay statements made by a child. And then the Deputy Judge cited from a decision of my Lord, Lord Justice Baker in Re C. This is in the first instance judgment at paragraph 159. Significant departures from the guidance is likely to mean little, and in extreme cases, no weight being attached to the interview. But we rely on what follows, which is where the Court of Appeal sets out the appellate approach to cases in which there are deficiencies in the interviewing process. Lord Justice Baker said this, the approach of the appellate court to this exercise is no different from every other appeal against findings of fact. The assessment of evidence and the apportionment of weight attached to each piece of evidence are matters for the judge at first instance. So this judge at first instance took the following approach. He first, as I've said, acknowledged the deficiencies in the interview. He acknowledged that there was a less than perfect approach to the truth and lies question. But he concluded that the officer did conduct an exercise, although he bore in mind FT's age when interviewed. She was not a young child. She was a bright and intelligent teenager who knew what the consequences of making the allegations were likely to be. I quote from the judgment at page, uh, paragraph 165. There then follows in the deputy judge's judgment a list of factors that he took into account that he balanced alongside the deficiencies he had identified. The first, uh, as this court will have seen in that last citation, was a conclusion about the child's broad credibility and her personality, her characteristics. 
She was bright and intelligent. Both parents, and I use that term advisedly, described her as a truthful child with whom they both had a good relationship. That judgment of her credibility at paragraph 130 of the first instance judgment completely reflects the evidence that was before the court from a variety of sources. Father, stepmother, head of year at school, safeguarding lead, and the list goes on. Enthusiastic, hardworking, keen, no behavioural issues, a model student. Stepmother said she's very smart, she's very good, we don't have to punish her. <clears throat> so the deputy judge cites those factors, and then he asks himself, what countervailing factors might there be that weigh against her credibility in this situation? And he refers to the issues of dishonesty raised by the foster carer. The first of those alleged uh, examples of dishonesty related to her referencing one of her younger siblings as her baby. And so it fell to be considered at first instance as to whether she was lying about that. She was lying about her parenthood? Or was she making a joke? And the court heard evidence about that from a number of different sources. The social worker told the court that FT described that herself as a miscommunication. The social worker gave evidence that FT described all the children as being, quote, her babies. The foster carer told the court in oral evidence that she called this particular younger sibling her baby. So the judge, the deputy judge, grappled with the possibility that this was fabrication or dishonesty in some guise, but concluded that in fact it was something innocent that she had said as a joke or just to repeat the way she referred to her siblings. There was then the question of the lie that she told to her foster carer about her access to pornography in the foster home. And the deputy judge noted that although she had initially been dishonest about that, that she then did tell the truth and did not maintain any falsehood. That's paragraph 131 of the judgment. So what one has here is the deputy judge weighing up different considerations that might affect his ultimate determination of the child's credibility and concluding that he was able to place weight on her ABE account. He noted the quality of her account given in the ABE interview. She was able, said the judge, to speak freely. And my impression of her within the interview was that she was giving a detailed account of the events which took place. Which, I'm, forgive me, which paragraph was that, Mr Goodwin? So that's paragraph 165. Sorry. I make, if I may, the following observations about the ABE myself, which I know this court will have looked at with some care. One of the first things that a court will want to know when a child is giving an ABE interview is whether she's asked by the interviewing officer to, simply to repeat an account that had previously been given rather than to tell the officer about the event that she is meant to be describing, if your if your lordship sees how free is the actual narrative? Is well, it a free narrative? 
as opposed to repeating what she'd said to somebody else. Exactly. And we have two pieces of evidence about that within the interview. The references are Supplemental Bundle 235 and 237. Those are the PDF numbers. They're F1 and F3, respectively. And two thirds <coughs> of the way down that first page, the officer says, yes, OK. So before we start your interview, you're, you've obviously come to talk to me about something that you made a disclosure about. But before we go into that, there's just a couple of ground rules. So that is not a request for repetition. It's asking her to talk within this interview about something that she had already made a disclosure about. Yes, the use of the word disclosure is inadvisable, but we query the effect that that would have on a child of this age, very unlikely to uh, influence her account in any way. And then well, we have... My, I may have missed it. Yes. My part, Mr Goodwin. Um, I think that's... Your point on that is um, open to challenge. I would have thought that, well, I mustn't speculate, but what a child would, what, what, what the interviewee would think about that. It, it might be, it, it, she might think that she was being asked to repeat the disclosure. It's, it, it, it's not the way the guidance recommends that the uh, subject should be introduced, is it? Well, I would say that she is not being asked to repeat the conversation she had earlier, but she is being asked to speak about the, the core facts that she spoke about at an, uh, on an earlier occasion. You've come to me, you've come to talk to me about something that you made a disclosure about. It's the something she's being asked to speak about rather than a repetition of the original disclosed account. And then, my lord, if there is any ambiguity about what she thinks she is being asked to do, the court can look at F3 of the interview. about a third the way down in the last sentence of that main paragraph where the officer simply says tell me as much detail as you can why we've come here today yes although Ms Foster would at this point out that uh, that but just above that the, the, the officer um, says something very similar to what she said on F1 I know you've come here to talk to us about something you disclosed Yes. You're not going to, well, I infer you're not defending this as a model example of an ABE interview, if such a thing exists, which is, as I've said before, is doubtful. I'm not defending it. Um, as a model your example. point is that the judge was alive to these problems. So your, your principal point is the judge was alive to these problems. But My principal yeah. point is <laughs> just that, but I do dig slightly deeper in the sense that. This interview starts, my lord, with a very extensive free narrative passage from this child, which is utterly unled. So this is uh, the phrase, the section that begins with her, oh, OK. And goes over, it myself. Yes, and then goes on over the next page. Tell me as much detail as you can why we've come here today, as I've said, and then the free narrative an extensive free narrative which is not led and which contains not just the core of the allegations she makes, but the detail within those allegations. So plainly, the child's giving of such a long free narrative was a positive factor that the deputy judge was going to weigh up when considering her overall 
credibility. And I'm not seeking to advance the submission that this was a model ABE interview. Of course, your lordship is right on that front. But it requires the judge to look, in the de look at the detail, to look at the nature of the exchanges between the officer and the child, to look at the extent to which the key, the key information within it is led, to look at the extent to which there is detail embedded within it, and all of that this judge did. There is not just a description, my lord, of the alleged abuse. There is an awful lot of contextual detail surrounding the allegation. She talks about being taken out to the car. She talks about the position of the men in the car, the stepmother. She talks about telling her father, or trying to tell her father, I should say, and the stepmother coming in and deterring her from talking to her father. She talks about the men accosting her on the way back from school and threatening her not to reveal the information. She talks about eventually telling her father. And her father convening a meeting at which the stepmother and the men denied any wrongdoing. She talked about her fear of the consequences of her own allegations. I was afraid to tell the police because I don't want to lose my dad and I don't want to lose my family as well. Supplemental bundle 238, page PDF 238. <clears throat> The next page. The last third of that page. Have we got the F number? Mm. F4. Oh, F in the, in the free narrative section. Exactly. Mm. Thank you. And then she expands her anxiety about the consequences of the allegations to include the siblings. <coughs> On that same page. 10 lines, 15 lines from the bottom. I have a sister, I have a brother, I don't want to lose them. If they lose their mother, what would happen to them? And then five lines below that, if my daddy gets married to another woman, she can take, she can take them what she did to me, and I don't want that to happen. So this is, this is context, this is detail, and this is, we say, genuine anxiety expressed by her about the consequences of the allegations. There's far more detail that this court will see within the ABE interview that I don't need to refer to um, at any great length, but it includes, may I just say by way of a few examples, that she had previously described getting on well with the men when they were first introduced to the family. <clears throat> she was asked whether she could see through the car windows as she was being led outside, and she said, everything black. Supplemental bundle 254. Everything black, i.e. she couldn't see through the window. Query whether that is a foil to the circuit judge's point about neighbors not seeing what was going on in the car. It's certainly a point that would need to be considered. She talks about the state of undress of the different adults in the car. Stepmother, I could just see her thigh without any clothes on. She talks about an up and down motion and she talks about the stepmother making a crying sound. She described the car looking like silver because of the light underneath the street light directly outside the house. That would be, in our submission, an extraordinary detail to weave in by way of fabrication to the rest of this account. And I make the same point about her next observation regarding the man next to her. Sometimes he puts his hand on my neck so that I can't see in the back, i.e. so I can't see what's going on on the back seat.
So those evidential nuances required evaluation and required to be set aside, set alongside the deficiencies in the interview and the truth and lies process. I'm going to touch on one or two other points that the circuit judge uh, would have referred to, would have seen, first of which was this point about the Google search and the narrowness of the street. Well, I've already said that the evidence from DC Rogers given to the deputy judge was that there were 80 houses in the, in the street. The police did approach the houses, but only spoke to one person. That's referred to in the judgment at core bundle 209. Your Lordship has the point about the child saying she couldn't see through the window as she approached the car. There was also a query as to whether there was an inconsistency in the child's account as to the location for the abuse and whether she had indicated that it took place in the car in a park or out of the car in a park as opposed to being directly outside the house. <clears throat> this is the position, evidentially. In her ABE interview, FT said two times they asked me to go to the park. I said no, so they just stopped asking me. That's at Supplemental Bundle 269. PDF page. <coughs> Two times they asked me to go to the park. I said no, so they just stopped asking me. There was a suggestion that FT, contrary to that ABE evidence, had said that she had actually been taken to the park. The only point in which that is referred to <clears throat> is in the follow-up strategy meeting <clears throat> of the 6th of May 2021, and it's in the supplemental bundle at I2. PDF 436, mm. update from social workers and police visit. Just to forgive me, Mr. Goodwin, you said follow-up. If the follow-up strategy it's meeting. That, if it's the 6th of May, it predates the ABE interview, which was the 15th of May. Yes. And my impression was that the reference to the park was before the ABE interview. That was it. So, yes. Is that right? So you, your, your Lordship is right about the sequence there, but the point is that at the follow-up meeting, on that reference I've just given at I2, right. it says about a third the way down, update from social workers and police visit. <clears throat> I think we just need to get that. I'll just it. pause. Um, Two. Yes. My lady's working off the or the PDF number. So the PDF number is four three six, my lady. Mm -hmm. top, mm -hmm. Close to the top of the page, third the way down. Social workers and police have attended school and spoken with FT. She has relayed the same information as before in that for the past three years, from age of 11, stepmother has woken up FT between one and three and takes them both to a park where they meet two males. Okay. Now, that reference to her having relayed the same information as before on that front cannot be right because 
there is nothing within the evidence from the school or from the police to suggest that she said originally that she had been taken to the park. So this record is a record of a meeting on the 6th of May. The police are present. The police are present, but, my Lord, critically, no one is present at that meeting who had been present at the school on the 6th of May when the original account was given. And the evidence about that was where? Directly above the reference I've given, in bold, this is I2, professionals involved in discussion, and then there's named a social work manager yes. and two police officers. None of those three was right. involved in the original discussion on the 6th of May. Where was the evidence before the, the deputy district judge of what had been said at the school? So it came uh, in, first of all, in statement form from the head of the year and the safeguarding lead. So first of all, in supplemental bundle page C56, PDF 226, CW. Exactly. There are two statements from CW, but it's that first one that deals with that point. The top line is C C57. Exactly. And then, of course, DC Rogers' statement, same bundle, C5, PDF 175. which describes D.C. Rogers' attendance <coughs> at the school. Paragraph 2. Paragraph 1, 2 and 3. Reference to the car is in 2. Exactly. Is there any reference in either of these statements or any other evidence before the judge from witnesses, those two witnesses, to the park? No. Well, I say the park, not to her having been taken to Sorry, the park. My imprecise question, is there any reference in the evidence that was before the Deputy District Judge to F having, FT having mentioned being taken to a park in the meeting of the 6th of May? Only to the men trying to get her to the park, not to being taken to the park. Thank you. I'm being told something different. Can I just... Uh, C17, paragraph 17, st statement of the social worker. Forgive me for writing. No, not at all. Mm. Was the author of this statement at the meeting on the 6th of May? Sorry, my lord. Was the author of this statement, PD, at the meeting on the 6th of May? No. Um, I see him on page C... I'm sorry, I haven't got the PDF numbers. C5... 187. 187. The... Um, the... The officer identifies the two social workers present yes. with her at the school. And Mr. Spencer prompted you to refer to what was said at C17. I haven't quite got here clear my mind. 
this is a, a, another social worker who wasn't present but was reporting. Reported speaking. Is that right? I just turned my back briefly. So my Lord, our analysis of that is that the C-17 reference by PD, paragraph 17, which is they sometimes drive FT and the stepmother to the local park, but this motor <coughs> is in the car outside the family home. That is in a statement dated the 11th of May. Yes. And we say must draw and can only draw on the follow-up strategy meeting of the 6th of May to which I've just taken the court because if we go to the police log we can see the contemporaneous account of what was described on the 6th of May at the school the police log starts at F70 on page PDF 304 And continues for a number of pages. But at F82, we have the, the key part of the police log. Landscape. F82, PDF 316. Starting child has presented at the school today <clears throat> and stated for the past few years. Any reference to a park in this paragraph? There is only a reference to the car. Mm. It says in the fourth line, car remained in the street. And there are two males in the car. So our our understanding, our contention is that the C the rogue C seventeen reference draws erroneously from the follow-up strategy meeting rather than the source of anything that FT had said and that all FT has ever said about the park is contained in the ABE interview. And my lord, my junior reminds me that the officers who were responsible for the police log to which I've just taken the court were the officers, as you would expect, who were in attendance at the school on the 6th and were therefore a reliable source of FT's allegations. by the officers. Allegations. So I repeat that the information that we know has come from FT about the park is in the ABE interview at F35 PDF 269. They said, can you go to the park? And I said, no. So they just stopped asking me. Lord, I've dealt with that park point in anticipation of submissions that may be made by learned friends, but I've deviated away from the grounds of appeal. I'm very conscious of the time, <coughs> of course, um, and I move, therefore, if I may, on to our third ground, which I hope to deal with more quickly, which relates to the application of the Lucas direction and the suggestion that the deputy judge reversed the burden of proof. There are three separate references within the Deputy Judge's judgment 
in which he reminds himself not to reverse the burden of proof. They are at paragraph 130, paragraph 167, and paragraph 155. In turn, it's not for the parents to prove that the allegations are false. But it, it seems to be a significant feature in this case that a child who's described as having a good relationship with both stepmother and her father is said to then be making up what are extremely serious allegations. Next, no reason has been put forward as to why FT would make these allegations, and whilst I bear in mind the burden of proof rests with the local authority, the absence of any malicious motive to make these allegations must weigh in the balance. And then finally, I bear in mind, of course, that it is not for the parents to produce evidence that disproves the allegations made against them, but it is a peculiarity that in this close-knit community, and the two men being close friends, that they have disappeared from the family. We say squarely that it is entirely legitimate for the deputy judge to take into account, account those factors, and it would be wrong and artificial to bar himself from taking them into account if he considered them to be factors relevant to his evaluation. <coughs> We are reminded, my lord, and this is not an authority in the authorities bundle, but there is a decision by Mr Justice Peter Jackson, as he then was, in a case called RE-BB, Proof of Facts, 2015, EWFC41, in which <coughs> Mr Justice Peter Jackson made observations about <coughs> A ruling by a circuit judge, Judge Bellamy in Coventry, that in the context of a non-accidental injury case, the parents did not have to provide an explanation as to how a child had become injured. And that to do otherwise, said the circuit judge, would be to reverse the burden of proof. Mr Justice Peter Jackson said this, it would be, of course, wrong to apply a hard and fast rule that the carer of a young child who suffers an injury must invariably be able to explain when and how it happened if they are not to be found responsible for it. This would indeed be to reverse the burden of proof. However, if the judge's observations are understood to mean that account should not be taken to whatever extent is appropriate in the individual case of the lack of a history of injury from the carer of a young child, then I respectfully consider that they go too far. Now, that's an analogy only, but it's a demonstration in my submission that the deputy judge here was fully entitled to refer to the matters that I've already cited and did so without reversing the burden of proof. There were very many bases on which the deputy judge concluded that he could not rely on the parents for an honest account. And I suspect it will be only necessary for me to set those out in bullet point form, unless, of course, the court requires detail on any of them. The first point was about the date on which the father and stepmother had knowledge of FT's allegations. Fundamentally different accounts given by the father in evidence to those that had been captured on the body-worn footage on the 6th of May. He had indicated in the body cam footage that he knew three years before and had discussed it then with the stepmother and the two men. In his oral evidence, he indicated that the body cam footage was wrong and that he had only found out three or four weeks before, as he had stated in his police interview. So a major issue in relation to credibility on that front. The stepmother found the deputy district judge was also inconsistent in relation to knowledge, 
failed to correct the father during the body cam footage when he spoke of knowing about the allegations for three years. I note in the stepmother's appeal skeleton that she indicates at paragraph 13 that Deputy District Judge Hornby was, quote, generally impressed with the stepmother's evidence. We, we cannot find any suggestion in Judge Hornby's judgment that he was generally impressed or impressed at all with the stepmother's evidence. So you continue the list of factors cited by the Deputy District Judge in concluding that he could not set much store on parental credibility was the issue about the father's HIV status, The father's assertion that FT had informed a teacher, an RE teacher, some days before he went to school, which was completely unsupported by the school's evidence. The father's suggestion that FT had been joking and laughing when she was describing the allegations at school, completely contradicted by the school witnesses. The stepmother's evidence as to how often she saw or had seen the two men, which was internally inconsistent. The stepmother's evidence as to whether she had ever met FT's school friend, D, the friend who had supposedly approached FT to tell her to stop telling lies after the allegations had been made. The deputy judge's observations that it was difficult to understand that the parents were unable to identify the men, that was a question of credibility. It was never a suggestion that the burden of proof had been inverted. And it coupled with the deputy judge's comment that this apparently close friendship between the father and the two men had come to an end without any reason and that it may be significant that this coincided with the time that FT says she told her father about the abuse. Those negative assessments of credibility adverse to the parents had to be balanced by the deputy judge alongside his conclusions that FT was Predominantly a truthful witness. I put you one point about yes. what seems, if I may, Mr. Goodwin. Yes. What seems to me to be the of those issues, the one which features most prominently with the judge, the deputy district judge, and that's the HIV status question. What do you say to the suggestion that that when he considered that particular lie, as he found it to be? he did not consider sufficiently the other reasons there may be for that fly. He could have, he could have articulated, I concede, um, a better analysis of why that lie was relevant to the core issue in the case, i.e. he could have applied Lucas more explicitly at that point to that particular lie. But he reached the clear conclusion that that lie was told on deliberately on a key issue yes. in order to distract the court from making an accurate finding, in order to invite the court to accept that no man would have had intercourse with the stepmother, as was alleged, because of the fear of infection. That's what he says at 174. What do you say to the suggestion that at that point, given the importance that he attached to this, he, he ought to have reminded himself that on this particular issue, there may well have been other reasons for the lie? Well, my lord, as a council of perfection, he certainly should have gone further and should have articulated why, uh, on the application of Lucas, 
that there might have been other reasons for that lie. No one on appeal or at first instance said to the judge that there were other possible explanations for that lie. That was not an argument that was put before the judge. Now, that may not obviate the need for the judge to deal with the point himself, but my submission to this court today is to invite the court to step back and look at the wealth of other factors that this judge used to form an adverse view about credibility. I accept that a discreet and very specific application of Lucas, having given himself the broad Lucas direction, was not followed through, or not apparently followed through, but when one looks <coughs> at the totality of the judge's analysis in relation to parental credibility, there is a wealth of material to justify what the judge ultimately found. My Lord, our fourth ground of appeal is that the judge was wrong to conclude that the deputy judge's findings were misguided and failed to accord with the evidence. You have my submissions on this point already, really, and I use that word painstakingly again. The deputy judge painstakingly recounted the evidence and analysed it and applied his legal directions to the analysis. He explained his interpretation of the evidence in his judgment, and he explained his interpretation of the evidence in the clarif clarification responses. He was bombarded with requests for further particulars as to the weight that he applied to X factor as opposed to Y factor. There shouldn't have been any of those clarification requests, frankly. Well, to be fair to counsel, I expect that preceded what this court has recently said in fairly clear terms about excessive requests for clarification. It may well have done, my lord. Okay. Yeah. But in contrast to the approach taken by the deputy judge, uh, unfortunately on appeal, the circuit judge's approach did not draw together at all the broad canvas evidence. It was partial, it was superficial, and to borrow someone else's phrase, it was blatantly island hopping rather than surveying the whole sea of the evidence. My Lord, may I turn my back briefly? Yes. My Lord, can I assist any further? Can I check if there are any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, my Lord. Now, our provisional view is that what we would like to do next is to hear from the other parties who support the appeal. And, and, and we, we read, of course, your very detailed skeleton argument. Uh, so we anticipate that you can both be quite brief. Lord, I fancy I can afford to be very brief. Thank you. Um, my Lord, I don't propose, unless I can assist you, to rehearse the arguments um, made by my learned friend for the local party in relation to the learned judge's decision to <coughs> effectively not to remit, but to continue by with the case management. The points that we have raised on FT's behalf are set out in our skeleton argument. Um, and we say, and we've drawn my Lord's and my Lady's attention to this, um, one of the infelicities, certainly, in the judgment of His Honour Judge Greenson, is that there is, as we've noted, a departure from actually the grounds of appeal that were before him, an introduction of his own findings. Um, but all four of the grounds which are allowed in His Honour Judge Greenson's decision are effectively in one shape or form that the learned judge had, the district judge, had failed to conduct a proper analysis, failed to hold in the balance various parts of the evidence, failed, as my Lord has primarily have just been addressed about, the Lucas direction. And there is, my word, a jolt between those specific findings and then almost immediately on the back of that, a finding that no reasonable judge could have come to the decision that D Deputy District Judge Hornby gave. My Lord, we have set out in some detail in our skeleton the authorities 
to which we rely, and I hope I'm in no way wishing to provide a shorthand uh, reference, there is a very helpful summary on appeals on fact um, in Stagelin and others by Lord Justice Lewison, referring back to Fage and others, but also the line of authority yeah. that has followed that. And the reason we rehearse that is, I suppose, the distinction that we would like to highlight for this court between an error made by the judge and the way in which the evidence has been approached, one example of which is simply to ignore a chunk of evidence, um, and other cases in which a judge comes to the very rare view, if I may say so, that when the evidence is looked at in the round on appeal, it is clear that no reasonable judge could have reached the decision that he, he, he did. And the difficulty with the ultimate decision that is on a Judge Greenspan case is it seems that that is what he's saying. But the rationale that he's dealt with the entire case in the judgment before that appears to be different. Um, my Lord, in other words, I hope I put that clearly enough. Yes, you um, have. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the difficulty, therefore, is that this case must, on any view, have been one that was suitable for remission. And I, I ally myself entirely with my learned friend for the local part. There was, in fact, my Lord asked for this, it's not in the supplemental funds, and I'm sorry for that. There was a re-W hearing, and on the face of that order, it is recorded in the recital that no party sought for, filling, for FT either to give evidence orally or to be further questioned. Because as my Lord asked earlier, the re-W process, one option within that is for the court actively to consider whether or not either by way of a request to the police further to interview or for an intermediary um, assessment if, as in this case, the police <coughs> investigation has ended, um, further questions could be asked that are at least akin to, although I appreciate not identical, to the um, position now in criminal proceedings under Section 28. Yes. Um, my Lord, in relation to the other matter, which is identification of the two men, um, one of the fraught issues in cases of this sort are where a police investigation is either awaiting the outcome of the fact-finding hearing in family proceedings, as often happens in non-accidental injury cases, but also, as in a case in cases such as this, where the police have taken the view that they will terminate their investigation. And there, effectively, as my learned friend for the local authority said, it is incumbent on the local authority to marshal the evidence that it relies on without falling into the trap of social workers becoming quasi-investigators. When the police left their investigation in this case, those two men had not been identified. I pause only to note this. The local authority complied, as is clear, and it's not suggested otherwise, with its duty of disclosure to provide what information it had. And it put, effectively, its cards on the table and invited the court to analyse the evidence it had. It was open to the parents, if they so chose, to obtain evidence from two men, both of whom are the father in particular, they asserted they knew, who were said to be members of the local community, who were said to be attendants at the local church. Equally, it was open to the parents, if they so chose, to put before the court evidence from the cousin, who, as again my learned friend for the local authority, draws um, to this court's attention, was a member of the WhatsApp group, which included the two men, and FT herself. So where the circuit judge makes criticism, or at least alludes to the inadequacy of evidence, I simply draw attention to the fact that there had been a very long process of case management and those matters had not been raised by the respondent parents. Um, my Lords, if I may turn instead then to, or rather now, to the main grounds of appeal and seek to persuade this court. Firstly, that the analysis in the appellate judgment is, um, I would say, wholly lacking. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Baker referred uh, only a moment ago, to fairly recent consideration by the court, by this court, of um, inviting further or other or better reasons. Um, it may be that my Lord is referring to a case that only was before this court five days ago, um, and that is, um, and so I apologise that it's not in the authorities bundle, but that is C, D and E, care proceedings, adequacy of reasons, um, in which... Lord, Lord Justice Baker considers the earlier judgment 
I wasn't referring to that. There's a, there is a some um, there've been a, there've been a number of judgments recently yes. in which this court has expressed concern, not just me but other J. Justice King yes. initially, about the um, degree of the extent of clarification sought by parties following judgments. And An appeal the versus a skeleton argument by the, another name, yes, yeah. entirely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but well, the only reason I raise that is that although I fully accept that the ambit of an appellate judgment must be different to analysis of the factual underpinnings when a judge is coming to decisions at first instance, the passage that my Lord Lord Justice Baker refers to in Lord Justice Peter Jackson's earlier case, which again, well, I apologise, is not before the court, but is well known, which is re-be a child, adequacy, adequacy of reasons, of reasons um, from 2022, EWCA CIF 407. And my Lord refers to that. And the, the reason I raise it is this. At paragraph 60 of that decision are these words, um, as part of a, the requirements for a judgment. The last two processes, evaluation and explanation, are the critical elements of any judgment. Um, in my submission, the decision of His Honour Judge Greensmith is, and I say this without any undue disrespect, a largely investigative judgment which looks at certain, it's the island hopping point that my Lord or Justice Singh made um, from Phage, looks at certain aspects that quite clearly trouble him to the extent that he'd even Googled the street before he came into court to hear submission, but then does not stand up and actually fit that into the logic of the evidence overall. And there are, whether one uses the island hopping analogy or perhaps the broad canvas point, these are very small brush strokes on the broad canvas of the evidence that was before District Judge Hornby. And the error into which His Honour Judge Greensmith falls is that having highlighted certain aspects which concern him most, he fails to slot that in, if you like, to the wider evidence in the case. Um, well, there are two obvious points there, the first of which is that in doing that at all, he is falling foul of the precisely the guidance of the line of authorities that Page stands on. But he is also, in doing that, failing to provide a properly reasoned judgment that allows the reader now looking at the appeal to see why he came to the decision that the learned judge was overall wrong in reaching the decisions that he does. Um, my lords, my lady, there are certain matters that I should raise, one of which I believe my learned friend of the local authorities already raised, which is the point taken on behalf of the stepmother, that overall the uh, learned judge was impressed with her evidence. That is found um, in the skeleton argument on her behalf. It's page 114 of this court's bundle at paragraph 13. My lords, my lady, in fact, there is within the judgment of District Judge Hornby a large section that goes through how unimpressed he was with that judgment, with, with that evidence. There are a number of aspects of that which he relies on, most notable of which was the discrepancy between, significant discrepancy between the account given on the body cam footage to the police on the 6th of May, and then subsequently, of course, the accounts given in interview only a short while later and then in the statements themselves. Um, within those, the most notable aspects were, of course, A, when the <coughs> alleged abuse was first known to the stepmother and indeed to the father, and the very significant discrepancy in their evidence in that respect. B, as my learned uh, friend has already referred to vis-a-vis -vis the father, but also the stepmother, the HIV issue. And but, 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 I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I know you won't repeat what we've heard. We, we have had these points, so I'm just going to go My Lord, yes. The only reason I raise that is my Lord, Lord Justice Baker asked whether or not um, the learned district judge had properly directed him that there could be other reasons. Um, and I believe that my Lord referred to the, if you like, the tail end of the analysis of that within the deputy district judge's decision. If my Lords go back through the judgment of deputy district judge Hornby, that aspect features large in his analysis of the evidence throughout. And I say, although not expressed, it is certainly implicit within that, that he has considered very carefully why that was raised. I should also note that, um, going back to requests for clarification, it was, in fact, on behalf of FP herself, something that was then raised 
as a request for clarification. Um, and my lord, my lady, find that. I'm not going to spend time now taking you to it. Within the uh, core appeal bundle at page 247. Um, and I will read out only that which I need to, which is this. As I indicated, I'm satisfied that I lied as to his HIV status. The reason for the lie was to support an assertion that no man would have intercourse with the mother. I have indicated in the judgment that if this account was true, which I do not accept, he would have placed the mother and the younger children at risk of serious harm. And he had noted within the judgment um, from recollection that actually the timing of that would have been at around the time when two of the children were conceived. My Lord, I should also remind this court, if I need to, that within the proceedings themselves, it became clear that the father had approached his own GP and had sought a further test in 2022. So when the learned judge was considering that, he was not only considering the lie to the police earlier in their, their investigation about his HIV status, but the fact that when it was then tested that the learned judge had corroborative evidence um, from 2022. Um, the, um, forgive me, Mr. Sampson, just quickly. The, he, he deals with the, Lucas... He, de he, de he deals with Lucas in his summary on the law, paragraph 161. Lord, yes. Well, how he deals with the law is he identifies, as it were, certain, certain matters in paragraphs 159 to 162. And then at 163, there's a, a series of legal points, which I assume represent a summary or maybe a verbatim quote of what he was given by counsel. That's not uncommon. Is, is that right? Uh, no, apart, that apart, from, apart from the reference at 161, where are the other references to Lucas and lies in the judgment? Is that it? Lord, my, I'm going to check before I answer that. Um, but my lord, my understanding is that having set that out, there is not then a further reference to Lucas okay. when Thank he's you. considering the specific. And in fairness, I have to note that one thing that was not done in this case um, and is overlooked, sadly, is the uh, guidance now given by this court that those on behalf of the local authority should identify the lies that they specifically seek findings on vis-a-vis -vis the Lucas direction. What I do say in this case is that there is, um, it is overwhelmingly clear from the judgment that there are certain central lies that could not but be relevant to the learned judge's examination of the credibility of the accounts and why they had said certain things. The most notable ones were, of course, the HIV status issue and when yes. they were first aware, and the father in particular, first aware of the alleged abuse. Is this a permissible line of thinking that? One of the reasons in Lucas people lie is to avoid embarrassment. Yes. Could, it, could it be said that actually positively asserting that you are HIV positive doesn't seem to fall into that kind of category? Well, my, my Lord, I, I was not going to trouble the court with this, but I was, I confess. At the time this question was raised by my Lord, Lord Justice Baker, of my learned friend for the local authority, trying myself to imagine what other reason there could be rely in which someone who claims overtly in his own evidence that it would place him at significant risk of embarrassment and in fact rejection by his own community should nonetheless have not only made that known but assumed as the learned judge deputy district judge Hornby found. Well there may be there may be a good reason for it. No doubt we'll hear from others but um, I just remind myself at least that we, we do decide cases living in the real world. Oh, my Lord, we do. And, my Lord, I, su I suppose another matter that I should bring into that particular equation is that this court is not expected to construct for itself alternative reasons. Mm. If someone is going to assert that they have lied for a specific reason, one would expect that to be read. Mm. Um, and in that case, I do query whether or not, in, in this case, anything was said beyond the bald fact that A, the father believed himself from medical testing to be HIV positive, but B, that he assumed that the NHS themselves would inform members of his local community 
a matter upon which the Deputy District Judge places some weight. All right. Um, well, well, I'm conscious that I am in almost all other respects yes. um, ad idem with the local authority. There is one matter that I do wish to raise, but it may well be that this is not now the <coughs> time to do, which is the matter that frankly first brought me into this case and troubles those who instruct me, which is the the difficulty in which our client finds herself now being aged 70. My lords know that the narrative of this case is that shortly after the Deputy District Judge's decision, the matter was listed in relation to her for a hearing on the making of a final care order. That was a matter that was raised in exchanges between counsel and His Honour Judge Greensmith, whose view it was, um, in my submission, wrongly that having overturned the basis on which threshold had been found to be satisfied that led to the making of a care order, nonetheless, the only um, avenue opened to challenge would be to discharge that care order. The difficulty, of course, for FP is that were um, this appeal to be um, refused on certain grounds, um, but the case remitted nonetheless, there is the conundrum that we face, or difficulty, that discharging the final care order and replacing it with an ICO in the circumstances of this case would of course mean that no final care order or indeed ICO could be made in relation to... Because of her age? Because of her age. Um, my Lord, I raise that so that my Lord knows that we have it in mind. But at the moment it does not seem to me that it's going to be helpful to the main issues before the court, um, but may or may not need to be looked at later on. Yeah, thank you. Well, my Lady, can no, I say no, thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, Ms Connolly, do you want to say anything? My Lord, um, I have the very full skeleton arguments, um, very full arguments. I don't think there's anything that I can particularly usefully add in terms of the argument unless there's anything that uh, the Lords and my Lady wish. Um, uh, perhaps if I just deal with two matters that have arisen. One is in relation to the um, reference um, in... Mr. Judge Hornby's judgment to an allegation of physical abuse raised by the child S, uh, and that's something that was relied upon in the stepmother's uh, skeleton argument um, as being there were still matters around that would justify making an interim care order. By the time the appeal was heard, that allegation had already gone no further. So it wasn't something that was hanging around, as it were. We may recall that um, District Judge Hornby said he wasn't going to take it as part of the fact-finding hearing. If it was going to proceed, then it, if it was going to go anywhere, another application would be made. It had already gone. And in relation to the re-W, uh, that hearing took place on the 18th of February, 22, and it is indeed recited um, that uh, no party sought to have the... Could I just orders. ask you, um, I should have asked Mr Cooper this, perhaps as you're on your feet, you can tell me, if if the, uh, what is the, what will happen in respect of the children if the appeal is allowed and the Deputy District Judges order judgment restored, in those circumstances, FT's existing order would continue? Yes, because it, it, would continue to, it can continue until she's 18. Yes. Have I got that? If I remember the law right, I think I have. Yes, so it is 18. And, and then respect to the other children? They would we? continue under ICOs for the welfare hearing uh, to take place. And what would, did you have a position about who should conduct that welfare hearing? Um, I haven't actually um, considered it, and it's perhaps something that I Maybe you'd, should have you'd, some should thought. Be, yeah. um, uh, I think our preliminary view was perhaps it should go to Mr Justice MacDonald to decide whether it should go, whether it should be allocated to a High Court judge, a circuit judge. I mean, it could, it go, could, go, back it could, could go back to the Deputy yes. District Judge. Anyway, perhaps you, the parties could think about that. If that would be appropriate. So, um, but I'm not quite clear what would happen about that. Yes. Had, had the appeal been dismissed by the circuit judge, then the hearing of the welfare hearing before the deputy would presumably have carried on 
Yes. Um, uninterrupted. My understanding is that District Judge Hornby had case managed the case, I think, pretty much from yeah. the outset. Um, and the consequence of the, of the appeal um, was, leaving aside all the other things that were in it, was that um, the circuit judge said that he would take over case yeah. management of the hearing. But clearly, that would, that would be wrong in our submission. Thank you. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it couldn't be another circuit judge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. <coughs> uh, Fultram. My lords, my lady, thank you. Um, you have our skeleton argument at uh, page 105 of the core bundle, and um, I'm going to make <coughs> some general submissions first and then deal, if I may, with some scientists and report to what we say were deficiencies of the judgment of Deputy District Judge Hornby, and then deal with some of the issues in relation to the judgment of um, His Honour Judge Greensmith. Um, obviously, to, to make the point at the outset, it's not part of our case that it is the role of the appellate tribunal, whether it is this appellate tribunal or um, His Honour Judge Greensmith, to um, uh, analyse or to uh, put itself in the place of the first instance judge. And, and we make those points in our document, and we, we accept that those points are well made by others. But um, where we say uh, the appellate tribunal, and in this case His Honour Judge Greensmith, was entitled or perhaps obliged uh, to go through the gateway to look in greater detail at the analysis and the um, exercise undertaken by the first instance judge is where he is compelled to do so. And if he is compelled to do so by there being a significant defect, either in the reasoning or the analysis. And while we accept, and I'll return to this in due course, while we accept that the judgment of his honour judge Greensmith is brief, we say it is precise and focused, and we accept that there are some deficiencies in that judgment, and I'll come to those in due course. We do say that the very strong thread which runs through the judgment of his honour judge Greensmith is his engagement with the procedural difficulties and substantive difficulties which arose from the way in which the ABE evidence in this case was obtained and the reliance placed by Deputy District Judge Hornby on the ABE evidence. And in due course, uh, I will, if I may, take the court through the judgment of Deputy District Judge uh, Hornby, because um, although it is a lengthy judgment, and although it is a judgment which contail, contains a significant amount of detail as to the evidence that is heard, what it completely lacks is a proper engagement with the nature of the procedural defects in the ABE process, the consequence of those procedural defects for the substantive evidence which was obtained in the ABE interviews, and what he fails to do is to properly analyse those matters when he comes to consider the reliability or the credibility of the young person. And that issue, the reliability and the credibility of the young person, features very prominently both in the judgment of Deputy District Judge Horn, but also in the appeal decision of His Honour Judge Greensmith. And it is um, the difficulties around that process that we say opens the gateway or compels His Honour Judge Greensmith to engage in the exercise in which he engages. If Just so I clear what you say, what yes. you mean by the compels him to engage with exercise. Yes, yes. Which particular... Uh, in, in reviewing the evaluative exercise right. undertaken by the judge at first instance. Yes. So it's very much part of everybody's case or common ground across the bar that the role of the appellate court is a limited role. It isn't the exercise that the appellate judge should undertake to go through all of the evidence that was heard by the judge at first instance. And in my submission, to some extent, that, as it were, cuts both ways in this particular uh, case, because while it's right to say His Honour Judge Greensmith goes only so far in his review of the evidence and in the observations that he makes. We say he need go no further than he goes because he identifies a very clear deficiency and a defect which undermines all of the analysis uh, such as it is and all of the findings that are made. Um, some criticism is made by the appellants uh, and those who align themselves with the appellants as to the way in which uh, His Honour Judge Greensmith um, 
reaches his conclusion. That deputy district judge Hornby reached a conclusion that no reasonable judge could reach. And he's using, of course, um, the language of the appellate courts in making that conclusion. Um, but he's also, in my submission, right to reach that conclusion if he is right as to his conclusions as to the procedure and the substance around the ADA. But in reaching that conclusion, Ms. Foxwell, that no reasonable judge could have come to that conclusion, is he relying simply on the procedural inadequacies in the ABE process, or is he also bringing into play his own um, investigations? Well, that, that is the question for this court, and if I may, I, I'd like to take the court through that question. I, I don't say, um, and, and I say this court shouldn't reach the conclusion itself, that uh, His Honour Judge Greensmith was only concerned with procedural defects in the ABE. He was concerned with the way in which the procedural defects contaminate or infect the substantive evidence, which is drawn from the ABE interview. Yes, and, and I'll I, go through that. I again. follow that, but yes. I just want to lay down a marker for the point that his decision that no reasonable judge could have come to this conclusion seemed to me to be based not just on the ABE point, but on other points, in particular the his own investigations of what he thought about about the likelihood of the investigations having carried out his own Google's Google Maps search. Well, my lord, to, to some extent it is um, a series of dominoes um, in terms of, of what happens with the exercise that His Honour Judge Greensmith undertakes. Because if he is right, and we say that he is, that there were def defects in the procedure, which led to defects in the substance, which impacted on the credibility exercise undertaken by Deputy District Judge Hornby, then it follows in my submission that he is entitled to conclude and compelled to conclude <coughs> that the conclusions reached by the Deputy District Judge can't, as it were, stand on their own two legs. And that, that's why he says, in the way that he does, that this is a conclusion that no reasonable judge could have reached. One issue which I'll come to in due course, if I may, or, or I'm happy to deal with it now, but one is issue which doesn't feature at all in the Deputy District Judge's analysis um, is the probability or improbability mm. of the account given by the young person. Uh, and when he comes to look at credibility, and I'll, I, I prefer if I may to deal with that in due course and I come okay. to the Deputy District Judge's judgment. But when one looks at the um, analysis of credibility, that, that doesn't feature at all. Uh, and it is problematic that it doesn't feature, um, because that goes to the issue of substance of the allegations <coughs> made by the child. Um, but, but in terms of the um, way in which I'd like, if I may, to, to deal with the submissions, if that um, I, I'm alive to the issue that my Lord, Lord Justice Baker ha has raised, but if I may, in terms of dealing with the submissions, um, just make a, a couple of observations before uh, dealing with the judgment of um, His Honour, uh, forgive me, of the Deputy District Judge. Um, we say that uh, fundamental to this case, both at first instance, and at the appellate level, and indeed before this court, is the necessity of there being a careful and forensic review of the ABE process. Because this case <coughs> begins and ends with the evidence of this young person. And it, it is um, therefore <coughs> crucial to look at the way in which the Deputy District Judge deals with that issue, and the way in which His Honour Judge Greensmith deals with that issue. So I will take the court, if I may, to the legal framework within which both the Deputy District Judge and uh, His Honour Judge Green uh, Smith were operating as to ABE interviews. The second uh, general point I want to make, if I may, is that we accept, uh, and, and I hope this comes through from our skeleton argument, that there are some difficulties with the um, end point that is reached by His Honour Judge Greensmith in terms of disposal of the issues in this case, and I'll come back to that in due course. But if this court reaches the conclusion that the decision of His Honour Judge Greensmith stands, then it is open to this court to reach a different conclusion as to disposal. Uh, and I'll make submissions on that point in due course. Um, may I then um, deal with some issues in terms of the legal framework within which the first instance judge and the appellate tribunal were making the decision in this case? Uh, this is set out in our a uh, skeleton argument, but there are a couple of points I wanted to signpost the court to. 
First of all, in relation to AB guidance, and I know that this is familiar to the court, so I'll take it at a, at a pace. Um, we provided the court with the relevant provisions of the AB guidance, and it, it is in our submission important to, to look at this in terms of the context of the decision that the deputy district judge was making, but also why there is such a difference uh, of view between the deputy district judge and his honour judge Greensmith. So I hope you received, and I apologise for the lateness of this, I hope you received a small bundle of authorities and uh, supplementary material from uh, the first respondent this morning. And if I could ask you, first of all, to look at the extracts in relation to the AB interviews, which you'll find at page one of that bundle. <coughs> now, of course, the court will know that the achieving best evidence guidance is guidance. But it is repeatedly endorsed by the appellate courts and judges in the higher courts that when a child is the subject of an interview which is going to be relied on by the family court or by the criminal court, that this guidance must be followed. And where it is not followed, um, we say, and I'll take the court through it in due course, there must be a careful identification of the departures from the guidance and a careful consideration of impact. So what then were the relevant provisions of the AB guidance in this case? Well, first of all, if you look at pages one and two, and this is the 2011 guidance, which applied at the time that these interviews were undertaken. It's subsequently been updated. Um, you will see at the top of the page the preliminary um, steps which are to be taken by interviewers um, in relation to uh, setting out the reason for the interview. And I'll come back to this in due course, but Mr. Goodwin this morning took the court to the way in which the police officer in this case explained the reason for the interview, that being um, to discuss the disclosures which the young person had well, made. Well, it wasn't quite that, was it? Wasn't quite well, that. my lord, that, it, that was in it was in between with what he respectively have said. That that may be a matter for I interpretation, but but I'm I'm signposting because the court to the framework within which these interviews are supposed to take place. Nextly, of course, the course will see the rapport stage of the interview. Um, relatively little, we would say, or if at all, in this particular case. And uh, the importance of the report phase is set out in the guidance itself at paragraphs 3.8 and 3.9. There is then 3.10, the requirement for an interview plan, which we did not see in this case. And then perhaps the crux of the issue in this case, um, the importance of telling the truth. And uh, of course, this is guidance which applies to children. And the young person in this case was 15 at the time that the interview was undertaken, but there were also perhaps some wider issues in relation to linguistic and cultural matters, which were relevant as, relevant as to her understanding of truth and lies, which were not explored. But if one goes on to look at what the guidance provides, none of it is followed in this case. 3.18 sets out um, the necessity of explaining to the child to give a truthful and accurate account of any incident that they describe. <coughs> 3.19, general definitions of what is a truth or a lie. And then it says in the third sentence in 3.19, secondary school age children, i.e. the child in this case, can be asked to give examples of truthful statements and lies, while younger children can be offered examples. And then it goes on to explain why that is important and why that is relevant. If a child shows a proper appreciation of the difference between truth and lies, the interviewer should conclude by emphasising the importance of being truthful and as accurate as possible in everything they say in the interview. How this is put across will again vary with the age can of the child. <coughs> Sorry, can we just go back to 3.18? Forgive me, yes. Uh, you use the word necessity. In fact, what the guidance says in line four <coughs> is there is no legal requirement to do this. But since the video may be used as evidence, it is helpful to the court to know that the child was made aware of the importance of telling the truth. Yes. And, and it then goes on at paragraph 3.19 to explain how that exercise should be Indeed. undertaken. But my lord, the, the 
guidance is clear, and I, I started my submissions, I hope, by making clear that we understand that it is guidance. It's not yes. um, a legal rule which the interviewer is expected to yeah. comply with, but it is guidance which is expected to be followed, yeah. unless there is a good reason for departing from it. And I will come in due course to the interview itself, the AB interview itself, and the way in which the officer undertaking the AB interview um, dealt with the question of truth and lies, or didn't deal with the question of truth and lies. And of course, if we are um, make good our submission in relation to this, it, it does have an impact on the substantive um, account which is given by the well, child. Isn't the point, if I may, the point really that one has to evaluate where, the, where, where this where one has to evaluate what is said in in um, the passage in, in the transcript about truth and lies, and determine to what extent that undermines the reliability of what follows. Well, it, it's, it, it, it's, as my lord points out, it's, it, it's clear it's not a legal requirement, and you you accept that. Does this say does this say, say more than that? It's the perhaps three three point one nine tells you what how, how to go about it. Yes, yes, and and then of course Appendix G provides further examples. Did perhaps did before we get to the stage that my lord has arrived at, may may I just take this court also through the um, decision of TW and City Council, yeah. which Lord Justice Wall um, set out a. Um, a template, if you like, or a roadmap as to how a, a judge dealing with a case in which there has been a departure from the ABE guidance then has to approach the exercise of evaluating the nature of that departure and the impact of that departure. And it may be that my Lord is unsurprisingly several steps ahead of me, but, but if I can just go through that exercise before um, dealing with this issue of what this judge needed to do and, and how he undertook it. So, so what, what else in the guidance do you want us to look at? Well, th those are the matters that I okay. wanted to look at That's in the fine. guidance. So okay. the rapport stage, the truth-telling stage, those right. are, we say, Thank the crucial right. issues uh, in this case. And those were the points that were made by my junior who sits behind me, Mr. Povel, who represented uh, the uh, first respondent in the proceedings before Deputy District Judge Hornby. And we say, in due course, those are the matters that feature in the decision of is on Judge Greensmith. Mm -hmm. So may I then um, just take the court on, please, to TW in the City Council, which is the um, decision of uh, Lord Justice Wall, the then president, in 2011. And you'll find that beginning at page 7 yes. in the authority <coughs> file. And um, just to signpost the court to a number of passages in that judgment, first of all, as to the um, status or the approach to be taken to the guidance, uh, and this I think is my Lord, Lord Justice Singh's point at paragraph 21. Um, you'll see there what was said by uh, Lord Justice Wall as to the status of the evidence, and he says uh, it's a long and important document, self evidently required reading for all practitioners in the field, um, be they interviewers, prosecutors, advocates, or judges. And pausing there, if I may, I'll come back in due course to the fact that the officer who undertook the interview in this case was not aware of mm. the guidance and um, therefore there, there were obviously significant difficulties. And if one then turns over the page at paragraphs 23, 24 and uh, 25 down to paragraph 26, Lord Justice Wall sets out some of the framework from the ABE guidance itself and, and those are matters which no doubt will be familiar to the court. And then if one goes on to paragraph 52 and uh, 53, it, it sets out uh, a number of matters which we say are relevant to this case in particular, but are general matters that uh, are dicta from this court which apply in relation to ABE exercises generally. And that is that the guidance makes it clear, makes it clear that the interviewer has to keep an open mind and the object of the exercise is not simply to get the child to repeat on camera what has been said earlier to somebody else. And then he goes on to, to make criticisms of what happened in that particular case. Um, my Lord, of course, 
those are the matter, uh, the paragraphs I wanted to draw your attention to in the TW case. My Lord, of course, Lord Justice Baker, um, in the decision of RE-W and RE-F, revisited aspects of this guidance in relation to uh, AB interviews. And then, generally, in the case of RE-E, the current uh, president of the family division, um, Lord Justice McFarlane, um, endorsed and reiterated the relevance of the AB guidance and the necessity of a judge at first instance, when dealing with the departure from the guidance, of undertaking a forensic exercise of looking at the nature of the departure and the impact of that on the substance of the interview. So what's the best passage which supports that proposition? Uh, if my Lord looks at the um, judgment of uh, Lord Justice McFarlane in re the beginning at paragraph uh, 58, where there is the sign pasting back to the TW decision, and then going on to look at paragraph 36, which deals with specific issues in relation to the ABE process in that case, and that's at page 60. But that, is that passage about the, the, the phrase you used about the need for forensic analysis it, is that used by Lord Justice McFarlane? That, that's my phrase um, uh, in terms of the reading both of the decision of TW, the decision of my Lord, Lord Justice Baker in RE-W and the decision of um, Lord Justice McFarlane. Paragraph 37 of Lord Justice McFarlane's judgment in RE-E at the bottom of page 60 in our bundle, line four of that paragraph, the yes. departures from the ABE guidance require the judge to engage with thorough analysis of the process in order to evaluate whether any of the allegations could be relied on. Is that is that is that the is it where the phrase which yes, I think you would say encapsulates phrase, encapsulates um, but, but your in my submission that, that would uh, be on all fours with that provision by that paragraph in the RE decision. Thank you. Now, um, what, what we say can't happen, and I'll turn in due course, um, those are the, the points I wanted to make in relation to the law. Yes. Um, what we say can't happen, uh, and we say this is what happened with Deputy District Judge Hornby, what can't happen is that a judge um, identifies um, a departure from the AB guidance and then fails to consider the impact of that departure, the particular uh, substantive evidence which is given by the young person. And so to some extent there are, if you like, two stages to the um, exercise that the Deputy District Judge needed to undertake. One is to look at the procedural defects, and the second is the extent to which or the way in which those procedural defects impact on the substantive evidence given by the young person. In other words, to, to go back, I think, to the question that my Lord, Lord Justice Baker was asking me earlier, um, if the issue is only about uh, the truth and lies stage of the interview, in other words, did the officer properly investigate that this child understood the difference between truth and lies and the consequences of um, telling a lie? Um, does that matter in terms of then looking at the substantive evidence that she gave? And we say it does, because of course the, the district judge reaches the conclusion, and I'll go through this, district judge reaches the conclusion that the young person did understand the consequences and did understand the difference between truth and lies. And that's very problematic when the exercise has not been properly undertaken. And we say the exercise that was undertaken was wholly sufficient. Um, and that is the matter that we say features so um, predominantly in the analysis of His Honour Judge Greensmith. So what I'd like to do, um, I have an eye on the clock and I may be able to do this relatively quickly or I can pause now and do it <coughs> after the break. What, what I'd like to do is to take the court to the um, judgment of Deputy District Judge Hornby uh, and to look at what we say are some of the difficulties uh, and then to return to the judgment of His Honour Judge Greensmith. Mm -hmm. I think it may take me... Uh, 15 minutes to do that. So I don't mind if I, if, whether you would wish me to start it now or whether you wish me to pause. Yes, 
Yeah, carry yeah. on and let's see how we get yes. on. So if we look then at the um, judgment of his honour judge, or Deputy District Judge Hornby, and uh, you will find that in the bundle, the core bundle at 194. <coughs> and we have made a number of observations about that judgment, but I'd like to signpost the court to a number of elements. First of all, the judge begins dealing with the allegations made by the young person at paragraph 9. This is, uh, I think, hard copy, page 196. And he sets out the allegations between paragraph 9 and paragraph 25. Mm. When you say the allegations, this is where he summarises the ABE well, into. This, this is his phrase, not mine. Yes. This is his phrase. He characterises these as the allegations, but he pulls out of the AB interview um, a range of material which he uh, identifies as the allegations that are made by this young person. At the beginning of that process, before one looks at the um, substance of it, at the beginning of that process, in paragraph 9, he says, there has been some criticism made of the format of the interview, and I shall come on to that later. For now, I intend only to set out the nature of the allegations made by F within the AB interview itself. Um, so, so that is how he deals with it. He signposts that he is going to return at a later stage to the criticisms that have been made of the format. But, but his summary between pages of paragraphs 9 and 25 is of the allegations which he says the young person has made. And he then goes on um, for the <coughs> bulk of the judgment to deal with the evidence given by other witnesses. And my lords and my lady will know that that goes on from paragraphs 9 right or 25 right down to where he returns to the evidence of the young person. Uh, and that exercise, which is basically the judge summarizing all of the oral evidence that he has heard, not the written evidence, down to paragraph 125. So that is, if you like, the meat and the, the focus of the judgment. And then he comes down to what he um, titles the evidential analysis. And this, we say, is uh, where he begins to run into difficulties. Um, first of all, he sets out in his evidential analysis of paragraph 130 his overall impression of F. Um, what he has heard from a number of witnesses. Uh, and this, if you like, is the jumping off point for the judge in terms of anal analysing the credibility of the young person. I um, don't think you should, if, if, forgive me. Yes. You passed over 126 to 129. Yes. I think those are quite, from my point, I thought they were quite important points he reminded himself of the difficulties of the hearing, the approach the um, this was a much interrupted hearing, wasn't it? Yes, it took place over the, three and a half months. Uh, in fact, F didn't give evidence, the parents had been translated, the police investigation, uh, the approach to the police. Um, the point about the foster care is in 127. And then he talks about uh, he's seen, he, he records that he's seen the witnesses and he's seen the ABE interviews. So those, those are important points to bear in mind. Well, well those, those are factual matters. They're, they're not um, uh, analytical uh, issues. They, they don't go to uh, his analysis, in, in, uh, as I understand it, and as he, he says mm. it out. So when they're, they're, they're just, yes, OK. They're I, just, I suppose, my lord, the, the thread that I was seeking to draw um, through this, these submissions is that if one looks at the beginning of the judgment where he sets out the allegations, he returns to the credibility of the young person at uh, paragraph 130. Yes. Uh, and it, it, is, it is, if you like, knitting those two things together, which allows um, his honour judge Greensmith uh, and indeed this court to understand um, how it is that the judge reaches his conclusions as to credibility uh, and the extent to which he factors into that uh, analytical exercise the procedural 
and substantive defects in the ABE process. So if one um, looks at paragraph 130, he begins setting out there his overall impression of F, which is gleaned from his own viewing of the ABE interview and the information which is given by others, including by the um, press respondent who, whom I represent uh, and by the child's father. Uh, and then um, at paragraph 131, he deals with the issue of the young person's uh, dishonesty. Now, Mr. Um, Goodwin sought to persuade the court that in dealing with the young person's dishonesty, um, Deputy District Judge Hornby undertook a careful, nuanced and balanced exercise. And in our submission, he did no such thing. Because if one looks at paragraph 131, there were fundamental difficulties in relation to the credibility of this young person. Fundamental difficulties which, when read together with the procedural difficulties in the AB interview, should have caused the judge to pause and um, take great care about concluding that this young person had given credible evidence. And if one looks at how he deals with, first of all, there were credibility issues arising from the foster carer who had previously cared for the child and had been sufficiently concerned about the child's presentation that the foster carer had herself spoken to the guardian. And that had led the guardian to suggest to the court that the foster carer should be a witness in the fact-finding hearing. Um, those red flags raised by the foster carer related to a number of issues. The child's um, uh, lies about small matters, but also the child's lies about some quite puzzling and uh, difficult matters. For example, watching pornographic videos on Netflix, for example, undertaking um, searches on the internet for um, risque sexual material, and lying about those two matters to the foster care, which caused the foster care to be um, concerned uh, as to the motivation, but also the honesty of the child. And if one looks at how the um, deputy district judge deals with it, um, he simply reaches the conclusion at the end of a process uh, where the <coughs> child had told a number of lies to different people that she did, that, did, did then tell the truth and not maintain any falsehood. The issue in relation to her sibling led to there needing to be DNA testing of the sibling um, to identify whether um, the sibling was her child or the child of her stepmother and her father. So these were not uh, minor matters. These were not um, passing comments made by the child. They were matters that caused a professional foster care to be concerned and to have to give evidence to the court. And they were matters which caused further investigation to be undertaken by the local authority. And indeed, they were matters that troubled the guardian. And the very brief review of that and the very brief analysis of that by the deputy district judge at paragraph 131 uh, in our submission uh, does lead the deputy district judge into error. Now, it's also relevant, we say, that the deputy district judge undertakes that analysis of the child's credibility without properly weaving into that analysis the procedural defects in the ABE interview process. In other words, at no stage in the ABE interview process does the officer properly examine with this young child whether she understands truth or lies, whether she understands the consequences of truth or lies. And then in other parts of the AB interview where the officer falls into error, for example, by referring to disclosures, for example, by um, saying to the young person, you are here to discuss uh, disclosures that you have made elsewhere. And for example, and I'll come to this perhaps after the break, where she says to the young person, your teacher was right to bring these matters to our attention, and uh, it is important to tell the truth, telling the truth is a positive. Those being bear traps that ABE guidance advises officers not to fall into 
because of how it may impact on the information that the young person is providing. And the signposting that we um, are uh, doing here in relation to the exercise undertaken by Deputy District Judge Hornby is in his analysis of credibility. He doesn't weave those matters together. And I, I don't want to um, uh, make the same point back against, as it were, Mr. Goodwin, but to, to our, in our submission, that's a, a, an element of what I'm talking about. If, if there isn't weaving together across the broad canvas all of the material that goes to credibility, then there is a significant question mark. And, and that, we say, is the gateway uh, that opens the door um, for His Honour Judge uh, Greensmith. I'll pause there, if I may, and, and resume after the break uh, by taking the court yeah. to one or two other matters in the judgment uh, and then to one or two matters in the AB. Um, I recognise I think I've been about 45 minutes. I anticipate being about another 20 minutes to half an hour, if that helps. That, that does help. Yeah, my, my impression is that overall we're, we're doing quite well on the use of the time. I'm very grateful to all the advocates for their economical use of the court's hearing time. Right, we'll resume at two o'clock. All right.